Today we'll learn more about Seattle's Chinatown and the real places featured in John Okada's No No Boy. I am now delighted to introduce Frank Abe, who will introduce the panel. Guest curator Frank Abe is co-editor of John Okada, The Life and Rediscovered Work of the Author of No No Boy, the first ever biography of John Okada. Abe was also lead author of the graphic novel, We Hereby Refuse, Japanese American Resistance to Wartime Incarceration. He wrote and directed the award-winning award PBS documentary, Conscience and the Constitution, and is the co-editor of a forthcoming anthology, The Literature of Japanese Incar Incarceration, which will be published next spring. Please help me, help me welcome Frank Abe. Thank you, Emily, and really thank you all for coming out on a Sunday afternoon. This is a great turnout, the best of our, our three panel series. I want to thank Stesha Brandon, the uh, Literature and Humanities Program Manager here at the Seattle Public Library, uh, for inviting me to serve as guest curator this fall. Uh, the, her guest curated series is a remarkable opportunity for Seattle's community voices to be heard and seen here in the library. Uh, and here we, today we're going to hear the voice of John Okada, uh, Seattle native and author of No No Boy. As Emily said, this is the third of, uh, and final panel of our celebration of the centennial of John Okada's birth in Pioneer Square in 1923. The sense of post-war Seattle uh, at, as a place is so strong in John's novel that it becomes like another character. And I thought it'd be great for our panelists today uh, to uh, bring both a personal connection to these places and a scholarly one. We have uh, Shoks Takeda talking about Japantown, old Japantown. Uh, Dolores Sabanga for Filipino Town uh, on King Street, and Dr. Marie Rose Wong for her study of the single occupancy residential hotels of Chinatowns. So our moderator this afternoon is Emily uh, Porcicula Lawson. Emily is the Historic Preservation Program Manager at Four Culture, and a former national president of the Filipino American National Historical Society. She is co-author of Filipino Women in Detroit, taught Asian American Studies for 30 years, uh, she currently serves on the Filipino American Curriculum Team of Seattle and the Filipino Town Corps. So please welcome Emily. I'm really honored to moderate this special panel. I actually want to say how I actually first met uh, Frank Abe at an Asian American Studies conference. And he had a table with his documentary, The Incredible Conscience and Constitution, about draft resistors. And I told him that I showed it every year in the Asian American Studies classes that I taught in the Midwest with uh, my friend, the guest speaker, um, Professor Philip Akutsu. And uh, Philip is the son of one of the narrators of, no, no, of, of one of the narrators of Conscience and Constitution, the late, great Jim Akutsu, whose life and mother was inspiration for John Akata's novel, No No Boy. But I first read No No Boy, surprisingly enough, here at Franklin High School. Any Quakers in the house? <laughs> Go Quakers. Uh, yeah, really rare uh, for those of us who grew up in the 1980s, 1970s, uh, to have an Asian American Studies novel um, on your high school curriculum. So I want to thank uh, my humanities teacher, Mr. Paul Anderson, who had actually formed his syllabus off of the University of Washington professor Sean Wong's Asian American literature course. And I don't know if uh, Chief is here, Sean is here, but I want to thank Sean um, for really changing my life there. Uh, I ended up taking Asian American studies at the University of Washington and became a tutor for Sean's courses. And for that, I really thank Sean and his friends for rescuing uh, the novel No No Boy and so many others and bringing them to light. It's one of my favorite novels because it narrates so much of our shared Asian American history in Chinatown and in the International District and in Filipino Town and the Central District. My grandmother lived in the CD on 20th and Main by Wonder Bread, uh, that's key in the novel, and the Seattle Betsuin Buddhist Temple. And some of you may know that I married a Japanese American historian, Dr. Scott Kurashige. Uh, whose mother, Nori, and grandmother, Reverend Tatsuya Ichikawa, was the minister at the Buddhist church uh, right there on Main Street. And uh, Grandpa Ichikawa served as the inspiration for the Buddhist minister in Nono Boy. 
So today's panel is a homecoming and kind of a coming full circle for a lot of us. And so I thank you all for joining us today. We're going to start out by uh, reading just an excerpt um, from Nono Boy. If you haven't read the novel, I highly encourage you to. Uh, I think there's some for sale here. Um, this was by John Okada, set in Seattle, Washington in 1946 and originally published in 1957 and then republished by UW Press in the 1970s. So this is from chapter four. There are stores on King Street, which is one block to the south of Jackson Street. Over the stores are hotels housed in ugly structures of brick, more black than red with age and neglect. The stores are cafes and open face groceries and taverns and dry goods shops. And then there are the stores with plate glass windows painted green or covered with sun faded drapes. Some bear names of exporting firms, others of laundries with a few bundles on dusty shelves. A few come closer to the truth by calling themselves society or club headquarters. The names of these latter are simple and unimaginative for gambling against the house, whether it be with cards or dice or beans or dominoes, requires only a stout heart and a hunger for the impossible. And there are many of these, for this is Chinatown, and when the town is wide open, one simply walks into Wings Hand Laundry or Trans Asia Exporting, Inc., or Canton Recreation Society with the stout heart and the hunger and there is not even a guard at the massive inner door with a small square of one-way glass. Inside the second door are the tables and the stacks of silver dollars and the Chinese and Japanese and Filipinos and a few stray whites and no one is smiling or laughing for one does not do those things when the 20 has dwindled to a five or the 20 is up to a hundred and the hunger has been wedded into a mild frenzy by greed. Yeah, that's John, John Okada. All right. Uh, our first speaker, actually, I was really delighted to meet for the first time last month and discovered that my mother-in-law grew up with our next speaker. And he was friends with uh, my husband's uncle, uh, Kaz Ichikawa, and some of you may know uh, our other uncle, Shinya Ichikawa, who played with the Skyliners. Uh, so it was really a joy to meet. Uh, Shokichi Shoks Tokita was born and raised in Seattle. He was placed in the concentration camp at Minidoka, Idaho during World War II. Tokita lived in Chinatown and delivered the North American Post, a Japanese-American newspaper, and attended and graduated from Garfield High School. He entered the United States Air Force in 1954, flew as a crew member, and retired as a colonel with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, a Master's of Business Administration, and as a Vietnam vet with well over 100 combat missions. Tokita presently lives in Renton. Please give a warm welcome to Shox Tokita. How I lived in the Chinatown district right after, uh, certainly after the Second World War, um, so, and then uh, talk about a uh, newspaper uh, route that I had in the Chinatown area and tell you what, uh, what my uh, open periods or had, had time to fool around with uh, all my friends and, uh, in, in uh, Japantown area. And uh, finally talk about uh, what my feelings were about the whole Chinatown and Japantown area and what it meant to me. So let me start by talking about where I lived. I lived in the uh, uh, New Lucky Hotel in the uh, center of, it was located almost center of Chinatown. Before that, uh, this was uh, right after the war, when we moved from the uh, concentration camp in Hunt, Idaho, uh, Father Tebeslar helped us move back into the uh, Seattle area, fortunately, and uh, when we arrived in Seattle on the train 
Father Tibisa met us and took us to the uh, Japanese, old Japanese language school, which is the uh, JCCCW now. And uh, he served, he, he ser reserved the, uh, a large classroom for our family. And at that time we had eight children, so we really needed that. He also lined up uh, a job for my father as a sign painter because that was his uh, job uh, when he was younger. And uh, at uh, St. Vincent de Paul, uh, in, over in, uh, over by the lake, uh, and uh, then uh, we, she, he also notified St. Mary's grade school that uh, some of us would be registering uh, to go to school there. So we settled down in uh, January, uh, in, in the middle, in the summer of, uh, 1947. We, uh, from that point on, uh, mom and dad with eight children uh, really understood that his, his payroll was not going to support eight kids. So they started looking around for a, another source of income. And since they were experienced in the hotel business, so they finally looked around and came up with a hotel in the uh, Chinatown area, right in the middle. Uh, its its name was New Lucky Hotel, and as it turns out, it was one of our lucky things in in our lives. Uh, so, in 19, in the summer of 1947, we moved down into the uh, Chinatown area from the uh, old Japanese language school, and uh, settled down right in the same block as the Okada family. The Okada family had a hotel, Pacific Hotel, on the uh, south, uh, in the north uh, west part of the block. And our new lucky hotel happened to come, uh, come in the same block on, um, um, on uh, Weller and uh, Maynard. So we lived on the same block, and in, under our, we had Akutsu, Mr. Akutsu's uh, shoe repair shop, a uh, small cafeteria that a Japanese couple was running, and across the street we had Baba uh, Sakoda's uh, barber shop, and also the Star Tofu. Uh, Mr. Sakamoto was running the Star Tofu, and he also had around the corner uh, Mar Hotel. So there was a lot of uh, Japanese people and businesses right in that area. Under the Pacific Hotel where the Okadas lived was an import-export company that uh, was uh, run by the Ikeda family. And then in the same block, we had another Okada that lived on the uh, next corner, on the, the uh, southwest corner of the block, and they had a little grocery store. Right in, right in the same block as us. So, and then a half a block towards Dearborn, uh, across the street was a, was a small hotel called the Fremont Hotel that, be, that became a big part of uh, our family. So let me backtrack just a little bit and tell you about what happened there. When we moved into the uh, New Lucky Hotel, from the uh, language school, uh, my father, after about six months working uh, from from the F uh, New Lucky Hotel and working at uh, St. Vincent de Paul over on Lake Union, he started to get eye pro uh, pro problems with his eyes and uh, also his hand. He couldn't hold the paintbrush very steadily, so his his uh, finally had to go see the doctor and he was uh, diagnosed with a severe case of diabetes. And uh, so around uh, late, he got, uh, had to quit the job at St. Vincent de Paul and uh, came home to stay and got laid up and bedridden. And he passed away in October of 1948 and uh, left my mother, who was age 41, with eight children, ages two to 14. And I was the 14-year-old. And so she used to, when it came to doing business at the New Lucky Hotel, she would come to me and we would talk. One day she came to me and said, 
you know, there's a hotel a half a block away from where we're at, and I'm thinking of buying it. And I said, what kind of a hotel does she ha does is that? A and she said, it's just about the same as this one here, about 45 rooms and uh, uh, the same type of thing. People that live, live there is, uh, are the same tenants that we have here. And in my mind, I'm looking at another hotel that I have to be a janitor for, <laughs> cleaning the hallways, cleaning the bathrooms, uh, doing, fortunately, my, my uncle taught me electricity, so I could fix uh, lamps and uh, small electrical jobs. He also taught me plumbing, so I was able to do some plumbing work. But I said, no, Mom, don't buy that hotel. Don't you buy that hotel. We don't need one. It's too busy. You're too busy, and I'm too busy. And, that, and she backed away, and I uh, didn't say much more. But about a month later, she came up to me, and she said, Shokichi, <laughs> I bought that hotel. <laughs> I was amazed that she had not listened to me. <laughs> Just could not believe it. But as it turns out, it was a blessing, because uh, eventually she got it running, and she in about six months, she had it about half filled, and it started to uh, supplement the, the income from the, from the uh, uh, New Lucky Hotel. So that was one of the lucky things that happened because we were in the New Lucky Hotel. So that helped a lot. Then about the same time, Jack Ichikawa, better known as Dry, approached me and uh, offered and asked me if I would like to draw, uh, deliver papers within the Chinatown area. I had had a uh, Seattle Times route during the summer one time when I was 12 years old, and I hated it. <laughs> the papers were big, and on Sundays there were 100 or more pages there, you know, and I couldn't even ride my bike to carry it. I had to push it around until it got light enough to ride. So, and then not only that, but I had to go collect from the subscribers. And then with the collection, subscribers collection, I had to pay the Seattle Times. And then a couple of people moved out on me and never paid me, so I had to make up for that. And then there was a, a little old lady that uh, subscribed for only Monday through, Saturday, Monday through Friday, and she paid me 25 cents a week. And so I had to go back and get 25 cents every week, and sometimes she wasn't home, so I had to go back again. So no paper out. No thank you, Jack. But he, he, Jack contradicted everything I said I was complaining about, the Seattle Times, and he tried to talk me into do it in that anyway, and I refused. And finally he said, come on, you, why don't you talk to the uh, uh, North American Post Office people, and uh, maybe I, they can convince you to do that. And I said, I don't want to, but I, I went with him anyway. So we went up to the, uh, the, uh, the, the North American Post Office was on uh, Fifth and Main, right around the corner from me, you know, the old Wajimaya store that was located on Fifth and Main. Their office was right next door up on Fifth Avenue. So Joe, Jack and I went in, in there and went inside, and, I, and the secretary that greeted me was someone I knew. She was an older sister of a good friend of mine, Kaz Yutani. And uh, she said, hi, Shokes. And then Jack told her that I had delivered the Seattle Times before, uh, and he didn't like it, but, and I lived in the middle of Chinatown. And she said, oh, you're hired then. I didn't even say anything. And she <laughs> hired me on the spot. And as it turned out, that happened to be another lucky one, too, because uh, uh, the the paper route on that, on that business was 
right in the middle of Chinatown and the northern and southern borders were Jackson Street and Dearborn and the west part was Fifth Avenue and 10th Avenue on the east. So, and my home, my New Lucky Hotel was right in the middle. So it turned out to be a really good, good thing for me to earn a little bit of money after school delivering the, that newspaper. So I designed the uh, route to be taken uh, on the north part of the Chinatown, down the east side, and all the way down to Dearborn. And uh, in the outskirts of the Chinatown area, there were, uh, when there were businesses like hotels and stuff, it was easy to drop off uh, uh, papers uh, at three at a time and, and things like that. But on the outskirts where there were just private homes and uh, uh, single people, that was a little more difficult. But uh, the papers were thin and light, and by the time I got down to Dearborn, there was uh, some good friends there as well. So uh, Mrs. Hayatsu uh, had the Russell Hotel, and the Dearborn Cash and Carry was uh, run by Mitsabe, and uh, KCW Furniture was located uh, right, right around there, and uh, then I turned from Dearborn up north, uh, north again and came on up and uh, hit the Okadas in our block and even went, dropped one off at Bush Garden, you know, right on uh, uh, their street over there. So that was my paper route. So I got to take a look, a good hard look at uh, the Chinatown area. It was home to me, and it was very drab, no real colorful buildings. They were concrete, gray, brown, and muted colors, so uh, nothing colorful. But you know, in the book, they, they call that area ugly. And I didn't think it was ugly at all. That was home. It was drab, weather-worn, and uh, very little upkeep uh, in terms of the outside of the buildings. So that was my paper route. In the evenings, uh, when I had some free time to go visit with my friends and stuff, I would hand, head on over to uh, 6th and Main. And I assume that's what you're seeing up there. The, pi the picture shows uh, looking at up up Main Street from Fifth Avenue. So what we, what I uh, used to do was up on 6th and Main, one block up there, when I went over there to, to, uh, to, to be with some friends over there, I had about three friends and classmates that lived in that area, plus uh, the others from, uh, like Paul Kogita used to come on over from, uh, Lane Street uh, shop by pushing all the uh, fruits and vegetables that were showing in, back in and closed off the, the store. So when the St Valley Food Mart was closed, Yuk and, or Don and I would meander Kitty Corner across Main Street to uh, the north uh, western part of uh, that block where Sagamia, the uh, Japanese uh, confectionery was a place where they sold a lot of pastry and uh, delicious ty Japanese type of prepared foods. And right next door to the Sagamiya was the uh, main drug. That's another place where a friend of mine worked. He was a classmate, Nobihara. He lived above the uh, drugstore and was, uh, had, was uh, hired part-time to fill in at, at the main drug, and usually he wound up be, being the clerk at the drugstore uh, in the evening, so Don Yoshida and I would wander over there and uh, visit with him and have some soft drinks and stuff there. Tom Yamaguchi, who lived down the street on Fifth Avenue, uh, would come on up and join us uh, there. 
And, and uh, one other place that was uh, really well known was uh, uh, a Gyokoken restaurant that was uh, next to main, uh, the main drug. And it was a very popular Japanese restaurant. They, were, they always had huge, uh, huge amount of people there for wedding, wedding uh, receptions and funeral receptions and just uh, a lot of uh, partying that went on there for the uh, Japanese families in the uh, Seattle area. When uh, the main drug and Nobihara and Don Yoshida and uh, Tom Yamaguchi and I would help him close up, there wasn't much to do, but we closed up the main drug about uh, oh, nine o'clock or thereabouts. And then we wandered across the street on the uh, south side of uh, Main Street to the main pool, which was a, it was a pool hall. So we would spend our evenings, sometimes we'd spend our evenings there and it took up our time. So that was a uh, fun shooting, shooting pool at that time. While we were talking uh, a couple of times, uh, we talked about, uh, you know, the uh, nightclubs that was in the middle of Chinatown and where all the action, actual action was. So, I, you know, we were in our late teens and we said, hey, let's go take a look. And so we went down to the uh, one that was uh, in the middle of an uh, alley. And just the way the book describes, you walk down a dirty alley pushed the button, they looked out at us, and then he, they let the three of us in, and we walked into a beautifully carpeted bar, a long bar, very nice, very pretty. Maybe two or three people were s sitting at the bar, and when we walked in and went up to the bar, the guy said, okay, what kind of soda do you want? <laughs> you guys aren't ready for a drink, so. I can serve you sodas. So that's what we wound up having there. And then we walked into the, further into the uh, uh, bar, and there was a beautiful uh, dining room, just gorgeous one, one that was way far nicer than anything I had seen around the, the uh, Chinatown area, and in fact, a lot better than ours. And. Uh, we looked around for the gambling, but we never did see anybody gambling. I guess it was just too early for us. So we finally wound up going back to uh, 6th and Main. But uh, that's essentially uh, what my uh, experiences there in the uh, Chinatown and Japantown area was. Uh, was I lived in that area from uh, age 13 all through my teen years and left uh, when I turned 20. But what, what did the uh, Japantown and, I mean, Chinatown and Japantown mean to me? Well, in my later, later years, I, uh, I also I recognized the fact that a lot of the older guys from our that I grew up, not, I didn't grow up with them, they were ahead of me and some were veterans. A lot of them went to the University of Washington or other universities and got educated and eventually they all left. And the, uh, and didn't matter who they were, Chinese, Japanese or Filipino or any of those, we all had the same kind of home, home life right in the uh, Chinatown area. We continued in our, ho in our home, we continued the Japanese uh, way of life. Whenever we had dinner, we, it was always bowls of rice, chopsticks, talking to mom and dad, mama and papa uh, in Japanese. And uh, so the, tr Jap the Japanese traditions continued as we were growing up. And after my father died, my mom tried to have uh, the rest of the kids talk to her in Japanese, but they, they wouldn't, and she was too busy to teach them. So uh, my sister and I spoke, uh, spoke per, per Japanese with them. But what it, what it showed me was the fact that 
people who came over from other country, Asian countries, and wound up in the uh, Chinatown and Japantown area, it became a stepping stone, in, as far as I was concerned, to move into different parts of the U.S. later on as they grew, found out what was going on in, in the United States, uh, adopted, to, uh, forgot the old way of living like rice, uh, using chopsticks, they went to forks and knives, and so it was a uh, setup that was designed to allow people to come from foreign Asian countries, get used to living in the U.S., and move on. Not as Japanese or Chinese or Filipinos, but as Americans. So it was a transition point as far as I was concerned, and that's how I looked at it. And I, I'm pretty sure that it continued on later on because a lot of the Vietnamese people who are outside of the Chinatown area uh, are all uh, are all Americans now, and I think it'll continue on. So let me turn this back over to Emily. Our next speaker, I grew up calling Auntie, as Filipinos do, as she was friends with my parents. And my father, Vincent, uh, called her Madam Mayor <laughs> because she was our Filipino people's mayor. Uh, Dolores da Sala Estigoy Sibonga considers herself a child of Chinatown, a product of Filipino town, because that's where she was raised by a community of family and friends. Beginning in 1935, her parents, Mary and Victor Estigoy, operated a pool hall, then a restaurant, the Estigoy Cafe, of course. They advertise in the Filipino Forum newspaper. Here's the genuine where you can have. Well, here's the place where you can have genuine Filipino foods, meals cooked like they do in the islands. And Dolores says the adobo was masarap, it's, it's exceptionally delicious. She grew up, went to Seattle Public Schools and the University of Washington, where she majored in journalism and later earned a law degree. She and her husband, Martin, now passed, raised a family of three, Teresa, Randy, Maya, and Martin Jr. After careers in communications and civil rights, she became the first woman of color, the first woman of color, the first Filipina American to serve on the Seattle City Council. She was elected for three terms. That, yes. <laughs> then returned to the practice of law. Now at 92, she is semi-retired and looking forward to her next big adventure. Please give a warm welcome to the Honorable Dolores Sabonga. Thank you very much, Emily. And thank you to the Seattle Public Lab Library for having this event, and to all of you for being here today. Ichiro and I grew up in Chinatown, but our feelings about the place were different. After all, he was going home after two years in a concentration camp euphemistically called camp, and two years in prison. On the other hand, I was a schoolgirl living with my parents safe and secure in Filipino town, a part of Chinatown. Filipinos lived, worked, socialized, and established a community there. We had restaurants, barbershops, Filipino barbershops were ubiquitous in those days. Social and fraternal organizations, newspapers, labor unions, business offices, photography studios, and a variety of stores. There were a few Filipino families, but mostly single men, the Manongs, as Emily said, who had come to study and work. <coughs> Pardon me. My parents, Mary and Victor Estgoy first ran a pool hall 
in 1935, then the Estegoy Cafe several years later. It was on 6th Avenue, <clears throat> just off King Street, a central location in Nono Boy. Like many of the storefronts Okada describes in his book, it had green trim with large windows on either side of the entrance. Next door was Saldivar's Barbershop. I can still remember the smell of hot soapy water, shaving cream, an aftershave, and the monos would be laughing and teasing and arguing. I'd hear shouts of, holla, holla, a combination of, oh, hey, watch out now, and go ahead, and more laughter. Then on the corner was Mickey's Tavern, and up the street on King were the stairs leading to the Burgos Lodge, the fraternal organization of the Demanos, where they congregated. That's where they hung out, because they lived in hotels run by Japanese families, like Shokes, as mentioned, the hotels I remember, like the Eastern, the Alps, and the Panama. The Eastern and the Panama are still there. They had small, single rooms, bathrooms down the hall, so the streets were where they congregated. Once a year, men would come up from California and join the locals to be dispatched to Alaska fish canneries. And that corner and the whole area was jumping. <laughs> it was an exciting and busy time for the cafe. Then on Maynard, about the middle of the block, between King and Weller, down the stairs, was the Filipino Social and Improvement Club, where guess where? They gambled. <laughs> Across the street on King, and Maynard was Russell's Meat Market, which supplied most of the restaurants in the area. Then there was a legendary Tai Tung and the infamous Wame Club, the model for Okada's nightclub. Later, when I was in college, a group of us would go there in the evenings to Wame to dance and drink, then finish off the night eating at one of the Chinese restaurants like the Hong Kong Cafe on Maynard. Okada's ho uh, novel begins around 1945, when I was 14. By that time, I was in middle school. In a few years, we moved to a house that my parents were able to buy when they became naturalized citizens. It was on 18th just off Jackson, and on the other side of the street was Wonder Bread Bakery, which was the model for the bakery that Mrs. Yamada would walk to all the way from Chinatown to buy day-old bread to sell in her store. And next to Wonder Bread was my school, Washington Junior High. I still went to the cafe after school to do my homework, and help mom. I'd started playing the violin when I was eight years old, so once a week, I'd take my fiddle to school, catch the bus, and go downtown for lessons. I recall that once on the bus, I was sitting next to a woman who said, as we drove down Jackson past Chinatown, now dear, don't ever go there. It's a very dangerous place <laughs> with bad people. But the place I knew was neither bad nor dangerous. Kitty Corner from the cafe on 6th and King was Ferrera's supply. Mr. Fernando Ferrera was an elder in our church. He had a large storefront that not only contained his shop and storage bags of rice and other goods, but Mr. Barry Hatton's law office and the Filipino Forum newspaper 
which my husband and I later bought and continued to publish the paper. There was a bathhouse farther down the street where the Manongs hung out and played cards. On that corner was a police call box, and I saw some pretty brutal things happen to some of the old men who got too drunk. My dad was too old to join the Filipino infantry, so he became an electrician during the war and worked at Todd Shipyard in Boeing. During the day, mom or one of my uncles would cook and mom and I would wait tables. At night, we'd sweep, clean, and close the cafe. Then mom and I would catch the bus at Fifth and Jackson, which was right in front of Bishop Drugs, which was owned by two African-American brothers who were both pharmacists and who we really liked a lot. When dad was there, we rode home in his 1941 Dodge sedan with hydromatic drive, which I learned to drive at age 15. It was the same car that mom and I drove to Spokane for my first real job out of college. Sundays was church. As I said, Mr. Frere was an elder in our church, the Filipino Fellowship, which had been established by the Methodist Church downtown. It was a place where Filipino students and young families like ours were very welcome, and it became a home for many of the early immigrants. So social life revolved around my school activities, church, and the community. However, the cafe and Filipino town continued to be my home base for many, many more years. From 1935 to 1957, the place where I grew up and learned the meaning of community. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Marie Rose Wong, a professor emerita of urban planning and Asian American history from Seattle University. While with SU, she, reserved, she received the Teacher of the Year, Spirit of Community Service, and Outstanding Scholarship Awards, along with four regional awards from the American Planning Association for Project Excellence in Urban Planning. She has served on Washington boards and commissions since 1989, including six years as president of the board of the Kong Yik Investment Company. Dr. Wong currently serves as vice chair of the board of Interim Community Development Association, love interim, uh, and on the editorial advisory board of the Oregon Historical Quarterly. Her presentations and publications include several articles, a book on Portland, Oregon's first Chinese communities entitled Sweet Cakes, Long Journey, The Chinatowns of Portland, Oregon, and the history of Seattle's Chinese, Japanese, and Filipino settlements entitled Building Tradition, Pan-Asian Seattle, and Life in the Residential Hotels. Dr. Wong is currently working on book projects that chronicle the histories of Seattle's Lukni Chinese Music Club and Seattle's pre-war Japanese American community baseball. Um, I also want to take an opportunity to thank uh, Shokstokita, Councilwoman Sabanga, for all of the time that they gave me when I was doing my research to <coughs> understand the CID and to understand the meaning of residential hotels. They were incredibly generous with their time, so this is my opportunity to publicly thank them. Um, within the next few minutes, I'm going to introduce you to single room occupancy or SRO residential hotels and a very, very small portion of the history of Asian America in the CID. Um, in, in 10 minutes, it's virtually impossible to give you the breadth of everything that you would want to know about the history of the CID. Um, the district and the buildings provided the descriptive setting for the character of Nono Boy, but these were also part of the rich formative experience of John Okada's life growing up in and around the residential hotels of a multi-ethnic neighborhood, much like what you have heard uh, Councilwoman Sabanga and um, Mr. Tukita share with you. Throughout the book, descriptives like ugly, dark, 
From dirty, worsening to filthy and neglected are used to describe the neighborhood, but there's also that bittersweet feeling of belonging and place memory. Um, regardless of how uh, those descriptives were used, this was home. The historic buildings that characterize the CD CID basically fall into two broad categories that include low-rise commercial and residential hotels. It's a unique American building type. The, the residential hotels began as wooden frame buildings and became masonry structures following the 1889 Seattle fire. These are zero lot line buildings, which basically means that they are, they are built to cover 100% of the lot. And so if you have a series of these buildings that do that exact same thing, you end up creating a wall of residential hotels along the entire block face. SROs were architect or builder designed and constructed primarily between 1880 and 1920, with a few of them constructed into the 1920s. You'll probably notice that the Publix Hotel is one of those. Uh, the banner or the, um, uh, the awning that's uh, over the entryway of the Publix uh, uh, says 1928. It actually opened in December 27. Um, not that that probably means a lot to anybody except me. <laughs> Frequently built close to transportation hubs, they remain part of the urban fringe as central business and financial districts develop more fully. The buildings were solid speculative developments and provided low-cost housing with flexibility for how long a person wanted to stay. Their construction paralleled the significant years of early Asian American immigration and settlement on the West Coast. Um, SROs have a prototype. Um, Typically, you'll see them between two and six stories. Very few of them had elevators. All of them had at-grade commercial storefronts, a central entry doorway that is with a stairway that would lead up to either a manager's office. That was also very rare. Typically, it would just be a desk or a widening in the hallway where a person would walk up the, that first long set of stairs and then check into, um, check into the hotel. Rooms were small and spare and aligned on either side of, um, of a corridor. Dormitory-style bathrooms that were shared by the residents and all located down the hall on every floor. Rooms were provided with light and air through door transom windows and exterior windows in the, in the building facades or through light wells. All of the SROs that you see in the district today have light wells, even if you can't see them from the exterior. SROs were market designs meaning that a patron could go from one hotel to another. There wasn't any lease, so if another hotel had something that could be considered an amenity, which might be something like a desk, a wardrobe, heat in the room, a single um, or a sink in the room that had cold water or cold and hot water, that was considered an amenity, and you had the ability to move from one hotel to another. SROs redefined the meaning of home, and very, very different from the Victorian ideology at the time. Um, that ideology advised that women and children be kept away from transportation and other temptations that you would find in hotel living, multi-dwelling units, or just living in the city. But the SRO helped shape the neighborhood where a playground could be a sidewalk, an empty lot, a street, an intersection, an alley, a, or a, even a business that was located in the hotel. And one of the examples that I wanted to include here was also the Fremont Hotel. Uh, the Fremont had two storefronts, one of which was occupied by the Seattle Noodle Manufacturing Company. So you can kind of imagine all of these long, hanging, and drying noodles that uh, made for a really tantalizing screen to play tag and John Okada's younger brother, Frank, and his buddy, Hiroshi Okada, no relation, uh, were regular visitors no matter how many times they were chased out by the older brother, John, or the shop owner, Mr. Tosaya. There were 50 business, or 50, excuse me, Japanese-American operated hotels by 1908. In 1910, and with the guidance of pioneer hotel operator and community leader, Choji Rofuji, the Seattle Japanese Hotel and Apartment Association was formed. By 1915, Japanese Americans were managing 90 hotels citywide, including the West and East Gongyik buildings that were owned by the Chinese incorporated Gongyik Investment Company. 
Seattle's Japanese Americans were operating 281 hotels in 1920. That same year, congressional hearings were underway in Washington to address Japanese immigration and exclusion. The Congressional Committee used Japanese-owned and operated businesses, and specifically residential hotel proprietorship, to measure their strength and potential threat to the greater economy. The result of the hearings was passage of the Johnson-Reed Act, also known as the Immigration Act of 1924, that essentially ended Japanese immigration. The Hotel Association recorded 138 member hotels in 1936 that included the Yakima Hotel that was managed by John Okada's father, and it's indicated by the, the blue star that I have on there. Um, you know, it's, it's important to note, though, that the Japanese um, Hotel Association uh, did not just keep information on how to manage, how to repair hotels only for members. Uh, that kind of information was available to anyone whether or not they were become, or whether or not they were members of the association. And the kind of information that they shared was how to do repairs in the hotel, um, understanding city permits and codes uh, that would affect all of the operation of the SROs. The war years disbanded the Hotel Association until 1948 when it returned to operation. 130 Japanese American families returned to the hotel business, which were only eight hotels shy of the pre-war number. The year before John Okada passed away in 1971, the Ozark Hotel in the North Downtown experienced the second worst hotel fire in American history with the loss of 32 lives. As a result, the city passed an ordinance that would reestablish public safety measures for hotel residents and as a preemptive strike to avoid any future lawsuits because of inadequate legislation and enforcement. The ordinance included revisions to the building, housing, and fire codes for residential hotels, but they were still not considered residences. Owners would now have to include sprinkler systems, quick release doors, front door locks, fire doors, peepholes in room doors, and a sealing or removal of all transom windows. The deadline for ordinance compliance was one year. There were no financing options to accomplish compliance. Door replacement cost alone was estimated at $11,000 per hotel, while the average income an owner could expect was a few dollars a night per room. One by one, SROs began to close throughout the downtown. Vacancy, neglect, and vandalism undermined the vibrancy of the CID and scattered community residents. The Hotel Puget Sound that's also mentioned in Okada's book at 6th and Dearborn was the largest SRO in the city. And it didn't only close, but it was raised in 1972 due to extensive damage. As it was torn down, the demolition company hired this Filipino immigrant worker to clean the mortar from the brick so that they could be reused, and for this he was paid one dollar a brick. Only three SROs were open in the CID in 1983. At the time of its passage, the city estimated that 1,000 units of housing would be lost citywide with the belief that displaced residents would, quote, find some other accommodations. But the loss was far more profound with over 3,000 units of affordable housing gone in the CID alone and within the first year of the ordinance passage. The Ozark Hotel fire managed to do something that not even the war years and Japanese American incarceration could accomplish, and that was to obliterate the Asian American hotel industry. Since passage of the Ozark Ordinance, the CID has been and is faced with a number of actions affecting the SROs and the neighborhood. A few of them I've listed here. It's a complicated mix of policies and ordinances and escalating costs for a property owner. In 1986, the National Register of Historic Places gave historic designation of the, quote, Seattle Chinatown Historic District, end quote, with very little mention of the other Asian American and multicultural communities that settled in the district. In May 2023, the National Register added the CID, along with Philadelphia's Chinatown, to their, quote, unfortunate historic places list, end quote. Like the Ozark Ordinance, the designation doesn't come with any money. It has no legal standing or offer of protection. 
It's intended to be a warning of what could be further lost in the CID's identity and as a designation that can be used as a community advocacy tool to help the neighborhood save itself. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anna Peterson and I'm a coworker with uh, Dolores Sibonga on the King County Board of uh, Equalization and Assessments. And I just wanted to ask a question. What, what are the top three things we can do to help preserve Chinatown? But the biggest problem that the district has right now is public safety. Um, we can build new buildings. We could restore hotels, uh, although it is a little bit uh, cost prohibitive in a lot of cases. Um, but we can provide the housing. But if we can't guarantee that there's going to be safety for the residents, people don't want to live there. And this is the experience that we're seeing with, um, with interim community development. Hey, you know, uh, patronize our businesses there. Not, not just patronize, but spend some money. <laughs> spend some money down there. Uh, you know, there was a lot of mention of the Publix Hotel. Just want to give a really big shout out to uh, our comadre, uh, Cher Amlag, who's holding it down there at, at Hood Famous uh, Bakery and uh, Bake Shop and Bar, Cafe and Bar, right at the basement, or the first floor, I should say, not the basement, the first floor of the Publix. And, you know, it's a historic place where you know, the Monongs um, stayed, uh, my uncles, and he, probably even my father probably stayed there. Uh, and now you, know, you can get uh, mochi waffle, babinka, babinka waffles there, <laughs> ube uh, cookies and cheesecakes, and the most amazing lattes and drinks you could get. So please uh, patronize those businesses that are, are there in the International District, Chinatown, Filipino town, Nihonmachi, all of that. 